Good morning, church. It's great to see all of you in the house of God. I can see the smile in your eyes. I know many of all of us are wearing a mask, but it's a joy to see you all in the house of God. Welcome to worship. And uh, it's such a joy to see so many of you here today. We welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today is uh, the last Sunday in August. Wow, we have been through this uh, time of uh, the pandemic, but God is good. And our response is all the time, isn't it? God is good all the time. And uh, we are so blessed that we can enter into a season. I know the, the, the weather is beautiful today. Uh, we are so blessed to be in the house of the Lord. Today we also are grateful for each one of you who are here. And the altar flowers are in celebration of a Christian uh, who has gone uh, back to college. He is a young man and we are praying for all our young people who are back in college. So the altar flowers are given by Joy Hartshawn. We celebrate that. And today also is a weekend where we celebrate with Andy and Mary Larson. Uh, they are sponsoring our radio broadcast. We Shall we give our loved ones a big God bless you for all their love and uh, teamwork? And uh, we are also thankful for our worship team. Uh, we have uh, Cheryl, and uh, our song leader today is Barb Ewald. We want to thank God for our music ministry. We are grateful for our tech team, Colin and Greg and Andy and Mary Larson uh, and Paul, who have been helping us over these past months. Shall we give them a big God bless you and thank you for your ministry. Sandy is also here for the time that we have been sharing with each other. If you'd like to send a prayer request, you can text the prayer request to 731-514-1946. Uh, 731-514-1946. I know and Colin is running technology today, and he usually puts it on for those uh, who are watching at home through live stream. We are so grateful that you have joined us today. And I know some of you are seeing each other after a long time. So if you want to take a moment, turn around, and wave at each other, and just uh, say hello uh, wherever you are, because it's a, we are the body of Christ. So we are so blessed to be together. Also, we have our ushering team. Thank you to Ann and Jim Wright who are ushering us today. So we are so grateful for each one of you being here. As we turn our hearts to the Lord, uh, Barb will lead us with uh, singing two stanzas of Be Still, My Soul. I know our hearts are racing. You made the effort to be in the house of God. Some of you are here for the first time or after a long time, but uh, we are in the house of God. Be still. And know that I am God is the invitation. Number 534 in the hymnal. And uh, let us prepare our hearts to hear the voice of God.
the hymn writer is reminding us that our hope and our confidence is in our living God, our hope and confidence. So thank you, Barb, for reminding us once again that our souls are in the safekeeping of our living God. I invite you to bow your heads with me for a moment of prayer as uh, we are worshiping uh, in truth and in spirit. Yeah, you can come in. We thank you, O oh God, for you are the shepherd of our souls. You give us hope. You give meaning and purpose to our lives. We are grateful for your presence. O oh God, your holy word says, my presence shall be with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Thank you for your presence with our ancestors, Abraham and Sarah. Isaac and Rebecca, Joshua and Caleb. We also thank you for our forefathers and our foremothers, that in your great love they have lived in hope and shared with us the legacy. We are grateful for you, O oh God, for your great love in, your, in which you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to share with us the good news of peace, love, joy, and hope. And, O oh Christ, as you walked on the face of the earth, you taught us to love God and to love our neighbor. You also taught us how to keep your holy commandments. You stopped to listen to the plight of strangers. You cast out demons from those who were oppressed. And, O oh God, we thank you that Christ was willing to suffer shame on the cross for the sins of the world. And he rose again, and even the grave couldn't keep him down, and we are grateful that you are alive in each one of us. We ask you once again, O oh God, to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, to speak to us, to meet us at our point of need, so that we will be renewed and refreshed to live as faithful disciples of Jesus the Christ. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Our invitation to worship is uh, in Psalm 105. And the words are up there, and you can follow along. Uh, this is an invitation of thanks to God. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known God's deed among the people. Sing to the Lord. Sing praises. Tell of all of God's wonderful works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek the Lord's presence continually. Remember the wonderful works God has done, the miracles and judgments God has uttered. O offspring of Abraham, God's servant, children of Jacob, God's chosen ones. We are so blessed that we stand in the legacy and the shoulders of our saints who walk among us and those who have walked ahead of us, and it's the Spirit of God who rests in our hearts, bringing us that calm and peace. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. We'll sing number 334, and Bob will sing it twice. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Uh... 
Friends, uh, we are trying to be as uh, clear to you, especially those who are watching us on Facebook and on the telecast later on on uh, YouTube. But at this time, I invite you to share your joys and concerns. I'm looking at my phone, which I normally have resisted for a long time. But in church, I do look at the requests that you have for prayer. Uh, just wanted to lift up some prayers that I have been receiving uh, from our church family and loved ones. Uh, Janice Russell is uh, at rehab in Park Point, so we are praying for Janice. And I also just uh, got a text for prayers for Bessie Hexdahl at Park Point as well. Uh, so she is in need of our prayers. And as I walked in, Gary, Gary is here in worship, and Gary has asked for prayers for two of his grandchildren, uh, Paige uh, and Connor, both of them uh, have uh, been diagnosed with the virus there at the University of Iowa and also at the University of Indiana. So pray for college students, uh, especially as school begins. There is a lot of uh, prayers for our young people and especially for the college students and those who are out there trying to learn and trying to acquire wisdom and knowledge. So prayers for these, our dear ones. And any prayers from the house of God? Any, any prayer requests you have? Yes, Diane. Yes, we've been praying for Christy, that is Diane's daughter and family in California. A couple of weeks they've been preparing to evacuate so from the wildfires that are out there so we are praying for God's hand upon them and Diane is testifying that they're all safe they are in good shape and they are also praying for those in in California on the West Coast who are having to fight with this pandemic that is going around the world Lord in your mercy hear our prayers other joys or concerns this morning? Yes, Ola. Wow, praise God for... Uh, yes, you can give her a big God bless you. You can clap. She turned 62. Marge, Marge is sharing with us that uh, she is happy that she had a birthday. And we are praying for her daughter that she is trying to reach, uh, trying to communicate. So we're praying for March. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yeah, I also have uh, received emails uh, during the week. Uh, we are grateful for answered prayers for Marilyn Larson. Marilyn had uh, been taken to the ER last uh, week. She's back home after a few tests. So she says, thank you, Pastor Robert, for your phone call to Muff while I was in the ER. And thankfully, I'm, I'm safe and returned home. And uh, thanks be to God for all your prayers. We also are grateful for JJ, Jeff, who's our radio announcer. Uh, about a week ago, he was coming to work. Uh, actually, he was heading to work when somebody slept at the wheel uh, and then crashed into him. He says he walked away without a scratch and asked prayers for the young person who fell asleep at the wheel. So we're praying for our dear ones. 
also got an update that uh, Roberta Olson has uh, been transferred to Good Samaritans for uh, surgery that she's awaiting on her foot. Uh, Janice Russell, as I shared with you, and uh, Lorna Hardman at Park Point. Marcy Reinierson thanks uh, each one of us for our prayers. She's here on Saturdays, and she's home. Uh, Donna Babcock is also seeking prayers as she undergoes tests. Uh, we are praying for Nancy Ziprick after her surgery. So these are prayer requests that we are lifting up. Also, a special prayers for now that the numbers are going up and people in the medical field are under trem tremendous pressure uh, to su support and also stay with those who are having this uh, hospitalization during this pandemic. Pray for all doctors, nurses, and essential staff and people who are in the front lines. We are also praying for God's peace in the midst of all the protests, the riots, the shootings, and people killing each other senselessly. Uh, we are praying for God's protection and also wisdom for those who are out there and for people who protect and serve. And as we also lifted up students, teachers, especially for those who are do doing remote learning. I've been talking to some of our young parents. They're saying it's becoming more challenging. So for patience, and for peace, that, uh, that this time we will also be supporting one another. For bus drivers, for instructors, for professors, for assistants, uh, security and health officials that we are praying for in this school year. Our ERT team is on standby. Colin is here. I just uh, briefly talked with him uh, during the week. Uh, the storm, Laura, that uh, made landfall in Louisiana and Texas and Oklahoma and continues to spin out towards the east. Uh, the ERT team is waiting for contact from the coordinators of the UMCOR. So please pray for those who've lost everything, for those who've lost lives, and we are asking God for the recovery and restoration. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Friends, I know you have silent prayers that you would like to lift up. I invite you to bring them to the throne of grace as we offer them to the Lord. Loving God, we are grateful that you hear our prayers. And even as we unite our hearts and lift them up to you, we know that you will hear our prayers. We also ask for prayers for one of our young people that has just texted to me that they have been tested positive and have returned home from college. We ask for God's mercy and also for healing. O oh God, we are grateful that you are the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We pray that you would hear the cries of our hearts, the sighs that we pray. And also, we pray for comfort for those who've lost loved ones. We pray that your peace would rest in our hearts. Lord Jesus, we know that you are constantly whispering in our ears, my daughter, my son, I love you and I care for you. So in that great love of hope and confidence, we ask this prayer as you taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are grateful for the generosity of each one of us who give to God 
liberally, without measure. We are so thankful for the ministry of our church. We've been able to help those who are in need. We've been getting calls from those who live in the community and even outside of our community for rent, uh, for utilities, for travel to their workplaces, gas cards, and uh, also for bringing the groceries to those who are in need. So we are grateful for each one of you for the, for the support. And we also have the opportunity, we have two offering uh, baskets right in the middle of the sanctuary. And also we are thankful, 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 Pastor Laura and I, we are also blessed by your generosity uh, to minister together. We are thankful for those who give through the mail and also through the banking system. So may God bless you. I just want uh, for a minute for you to think about what you are grateful for. We don't have to think only during Thanksgiving, but what you are thankful for at this time during the season where God has brought us through so many challenges. So make that your prayer, and uh, we will sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Loving God, we are so blessed that we can be in your house, we can stay in our homes, and we can participate as the community and a body of Christ with hearts full of thanks and gratitude. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Morning and night, new mercies we see. We are thankful for family, we are thankful for food, we are thankful for clothing and shelter that we can be blessed by you. And now as we offer ourselves at your throne of grace, that you would melt us, mold us, and make us to be your instruments that will go out into the world to bring your love, your hope to those in need. Bless every hand, heart, and home, and use these gifts, these tithes, and offerings for your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are uh, journeying through the Gospel of Matthew for the past couple of weeks. Uh, we have been looking at the life of Jesus and his disciples. We uh, were two weeks ago looking at how Jesus invited Peter to walk on the water. And then Peter, when he looked at the waves, he almost drowned. And the Lord was there to grab him and pick him up. And then the last week, we looked at Peter making the declaration when Jesus asked them, the question, who do people say that I am, and who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. With that as a background for this scripture, hear now the words of Matthew in Matthew 16, verses 24 to 28. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
will sing Jesus Loves Me, and uh, Diane will share with us the children's time. girls and boys, boys and girls. It's so good to be with you again, and I hope you're all doing well. Before we start talking about our lesson today, I want to give a shout out to our junior high and high school students. Two weeks from today, we are going to start Sunday school, and it's going to be, um, some of it is going to be via Facebook Live, and the junior high and high school are going to be on Zoom. Their teachers, Craig and Pastor Laura, when she comes back, and Jen Jacobs and Aranda and Ellen Hansen are all going to be downstairs in the confirmation room and the art room. But this is what we need from you. We need your email address. And so Julie in our church office can send you a link and so you can be online and connected. We so, so, so want to connect with you. So send your email address or have your mom send it um, to Julie in the church office so we can make all that happen. This morning, I wanted to talk to you about three things. Sometimes it helps me and maybe it helps you if we just use our fingers to remember three things that we're going to talk about. Pastor Robert read this scripture this morning talking about Jesus and the cross and something else that's just a little tricky, even for us adults. Jesus said to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Now, I don't know about you boys and girls, but sometimes denying myself, what in the world does that mean? Does it mean that I shouldn't have been thinking about what I was going to wear so much to church and did it go together? Or does it mean I shouldn't think about things that I want so much instead of things that I need? I'm not sure, maybe you have an idea, but I think it means that when we get up in the morning, me, myself, shouldn't be the first thing that I think about. I wonder what should be our first thing to think about. You're right, Jesus. Our first thought, our first focus of our day should be Jesus, denying ourselves. That's the first thing. And then the second thing, Pastor Robert said in Matthew, pick up your cross. Well, I don't know, boys and girls, do you have a cross that you pick up each day? I don't exactly have a cross. But it means that we should think about the cross, and maybe Colin can get a picture of our cross behind us. We should think about the cross and what that really means. I'm sure you know a lot about it already because you have been coming to children's time, you have been coming to Sunday school, and you know what happened on the cross, that Jesus died on the cross. And he did that for all of us, for the forgiveness of our sins. So that's our second thing. Our first thing is denying yourself, like denying yourself. 
not thinking about yourself first. And then the cross, picking up your cross. And then the third thing, which you have already been doing a lot, I know you have, you have been coming to Sunday school or watching at home, you're seeing me on the screen, you have been praying, and that means talking to Jesus and listening. You have been telling other people about God and Jesus, and that is following Jesus too. So you have been doing all those things. You've been reading your Bible, but I want you to do it more and more and more. So three things, what were they again? Denying yourself. That means don't think about Diane first thing in the morning. Think about Jesus. It means picking up your cross. That means thinking about what happened on the cross that Jesus did for us, and then following Jesus. And I don't know, Colin, if I just, Maureen knows, I just got my cross necklace. I've had lots of them through the years, and I just wanted to have a new one so I can wear my cross. And maybe, boys and girls, you have a necklace or you have a cross or you have a cross that you've made in Sunday school so you can look at it and think about it. But this helps me remember those three things. So let's pray. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for dying on the cross for us. We want to do our best to follow you. Amen. Thank you to Barb and Diane for sharing with us. Today our theme is Jesus and the cross. And I know that many of you, as Diane shared with us, uh, the necklace, in fact, I too have one in my, uh, it's under my clergy collar right now, but it's a, a reminder of uh, who we are and whose we are. And uh, today our theme is uh, the cross. So the title of uh, my sermon and our meditation is A Cross-Less Christianity. A Cross-Less Christianity. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, we thank you for the privilege to sit at your feet and to hear the voice and the words of Jesus the Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, because you are the Lord, the rock, and strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. James Moore, in his work, Choosing the Way to the Cross, talks about a church which wanted to improve their attendance at their worship service. So, as you do, you hire a company, so they hired a powerful advertising agency to come in to study their situation and make recommendations. So the ad agency did their research and then suggested that the church should get rid of all the crosses in the church because the cross might send 
a negative message to prospective young worshipers. Now, I'm sure that in their history as a company, they had some brilliant ideas, and this was not one of them. We cannot get rid of the crosses. We do not want to get rid of our cross. The cross is the symbol of our faith, of hope, love, and forgiveness. The cross is a powerful reminder of God's sacrificial and redemptive love for us. And the cross is a constant signal to us of how God wants us to love and live in our world today. And we are not called to be those who just wear a cross and walk around because we are called to be ambassadors for Christ and his mission and also to embody what Christ has done on the cross was their response to that research of the ad agency. The second president of the United States, John Adams said, and I quote, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for a government of any other. Or in other words, what he was saying was, unless we remain as a Christian nation, our constitution will not be able to function effectively. And the question is, is John Adams right? Can our society survive without the Christ, the cross, and the Christian faith? There are many who would say that religion does not have the influence that it once had. And I agree with that. But they go on to say that religion is no longer relevant. It is not necessary to create a good world. That there are no absolutes, there are no morals, there is no objective truth. The question is, are they right? Some of you know Dennis Prager. He's a Jewish social critic and scholar. And he says that the favorite response that he has for this question is a personal story and a personal experience. So he says, say that you are walking one night in an alley on a Friday at 11 p.m., maybe in a city like New York or Miami or Las, Los Angeles. The lights are dimming as you, they illuminate your car, which is 300 yards away. And suddenly, 10 young people wearing leather jackets, swaggering down the alley towards you. Would you feel comfortable if you knew that these young people had just come out from a Friday night Bible study? Every time Prager asks this question, the overwhelming answer has been, yes, we would be comfortable because these are young people who were in a Bible study. In most polls, on the most practical level, people acknowledge that religion has a positive and good influence. Our society cannot exist without the Christian values, morals, and ethics. And even our constitution will not be able to measure up to the conditions of faith and living even today. Religion is necessary for a civil society, people who are social agents will say. But let me ask you a personal question. This is not about society, but it's about Christianity itself. Can Christianity exist without the cross? Can Christianity be lived out without the cross? And let me answer that question up front. No, it cannot. Remove the cross from our faith, and it becomes a house of cards which will crumble at the slightest of weight that falls on it. Why is that, you might ask? Why is that? Because Christianity without a cross is a social entity without a savior. It is a convenience without a conviction. It is a sacrifice for no cause at all. So let's look at these three important aspects of why Christianity matters and why the cross is important. Firstly, the Christian faith without the cross is a sect without a savior. If you look at this passage that Jesus and his disciples are engaged in, it's a personal teaching to the disciples. Jesus says, if any want to become 
my disciples. Let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Take up their cross and follow me. Remember I shared with you how Peter had declared that Jesus, when he asked that question, who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus tells him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my heavenly father through the Holy Spirit. And then Peter, for a moment, when he made that declaration, he made that declaration which changed the history of the world on its head. You are the Christ. I heard about a preacher who was confronted by a stranger after a service like this. He said, I don't like the way you spoke about the cross. I think that instead of emphasizing the death of Christ and his sacrifice, it would be better to preach Jesus, the teacher and a good example. The preacher replied, if I presented Christ in that way, would you be willing to follow him? I certainly would, replied the stranger. Well, all right then, let's put this record straight. So he said, let's take the first step looking at Jesus. Can you claim that you had no sin because Jesus did not sin? The stranger said he was confused and he said, why? No, I'm a sinner. I sin. I fall short of the standards and the values of God. And the preacher said, then that is your greatest need because you need a savior. You do not need a social and a good example. Dearly beloved, the Christianity without a cross becomes a social organization. It becomes a social interaction and a social meeting place. Paul says, for the preaching of the cross to them that are perishing is foolishness. But unto those who are being saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God unto salvation. Here is what Jesus says. If any of you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow me. Secondly, Christianity becomes just a convenience. It becomes a convenience without any kind of conviction. Look at verse 25. Jesus says, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And for those who lose their life for my sake will find it. What is he talking about? Philosopher Soren Kierkegaard once said, and I quote, that there are more admirers of Christ than followers of Jesus. There are more admirers of Christ than followers of Jesus. You can admire Jesus easily and still go on with church activities. One can come to worship and feel morally convicted or pleasantly uplifted and go home satisfied only to return to the same old, same old life because nothing has changed. Still admiring Christ from a distance. But the choice is whether we seek to be disciples being changed by faith or being content, being admirers of Christ. It is a paradoxical way of what Jesus is saying here in this passage. Whereby losing means gaining, dying means living, becoming weak and vulnerable also gives us courage. It is counterintuitive to the world that we live in. The more we embrace the way of the cross, the more we open ourselves to God's love, the more we discover joy and abundance. Following Jesus has to be a way of life. It is a way of life of letting go. It is a way of life which is the most powerful way of giving it away. If somebody asks for your cloak, if he has none, Jesus says, give it away. If somebody asks you to walk the second mile instead of one, walk the other mile. If somebody hit, slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. And so much is there in this meat of what Jesus is inviting us. Today, if somebody slaps you on one cheek, the instant reaction is to retaliate. This is where people get confused about true discipleship 
by choosing not to die to the things that they hold dear, but rather to just cling on to the things that are immaterial. From the pages of history, I would like to share when Poland was still under communist rule, the prime minister offered and ordered all crucifixes to be removed from the classrooms of the children in their schools. And leaders were protesting the removal of the cross. It stirred anger and resentment all across Poland. Ultimately, the government relented, insisting that the law remain on the books, but agreeing not to press for the removal of crucifixes, particularly in the classrooms. But one zealous communist school administrator decided that the law was the law. So one evening, he had seven large crucifixes removed from the classrooms where they had hung since the 1920s when the school was founded. Later on, a group of parents entered the school and hung more crosses. So the administrator promptly had those taken down. The next day, two-thirds of the school's 600 students staged a protest. They were there when heavily armed riot police arrived and the students were forced out onto the street. And there they were joined by 2,500 other students from near, nearby schools for a time of prayer in support of this protest. The soldiers now surrounded the church, but the press reporters were there and pictures from the inside of the church of the students holding their crosses high above their heads were flashed around the world. So did the words of the priest who delivered the message to the weeping congregation that day with these words, and I quote, there is no Poland without a cross. There is no Poland without a cross. Perhaps the cross has come to symbolize comfort for some of us, because in our country, we don't see that much that we need to deny ourselves or even sacrifice in our lives. The more we are called upon to carry our own cross, the more we will understand the Holy One, Jesus Christ, who carried his own cross to the outside of the city walls of Jerusalem to a hill called Calvary, where he gave his life for you and for me. Thirdly and quickly, the cross is an emblem and a symbol of sacrifice for a divine cause a symbol of sacrifice for a divine cause. William J. Carl III, in his work, Church People Beware, elaborates on the word sacrifice, saying it is not a word that we use much these days. For a moment, just think, when was the last time you heard the word sacrifice? When was it that you thought about something that you have sacrificed. Come to think of it, there is only one sport, as far as I know, where the term is actually used. Do you know which sport that is? There is a sport in which the word sacrifice is used. And you can hear Harry Carey announcing it even on the radio. And there it goes, a long fly ball to the left. Easy out. But the man on third tops on and trots home. Sacrifice fly. What a great idea. Even though the run is scored, you are out, but you helped someone else score the run. Baseball is one of the few sports where you lose, but the team still gains. Comedian George Carlin spelled this out, and I would like to share this with you, contrasting the hardness of football to the softness of baseball. This is what he says. In football, you tackle. In baseball, you catch flies. In football, you punt. In baseball, you bunt. Football is played on a gridiron. Baseball is played on a field. In football, you score. In baseball, you arrive home. In football, you kill. In baseball, you sacrifice. Baseball may be the only sport where you'll actually hear the word sacrifice. It is one of the few places anywhere that you will hear it in this self-centered 
take care of yourself. Don't worry about anybody else society. That's why today the generation is called a selfie generation. Everything is a selfie. In contrast to football, sacrifice may sound like a sign of weakness. But I dearly beloved, let me tell you, whoever sacrifices anything anymore in a time like ours, whoever is willing to deny themselves or take up their crosses anymore, we have very few of them left in our world. So just to wrap it up, the cross for Christianity becomes, without, without the cross, Christianity becomes a social entity. It becomes a convenience without a conviction. It becomes a sacrifice without no cause. Let me tell you a true story that happened just very recently as we conclude. There was a young man named Mike Cohen who was diagnosed with leukemia when he was 18 years old. But intense chemo and radiation treatment eliminated the leukemia. And Mike returned to the active lifestyle as a healthy young man. He became an avid hiker, a biker, taking cross-country trips on his bicycle to honor cancer doctors and those who had saved his life. What he didn't realize was that the aggressive treatments for his leukemia had damaged his heart muscle. By the age of 33, his heart was failing. In February of 2018, he lay in a hospital in San Diego with a life-threatening blood clot that was strangulating his already weak heart. There was another young man whose name is James Mazzuccelli. James was a Navy flight surgeon known for his dedication to the country, his courage, and his selflessness. In February of 2018, James was killed in a helicopter training mission at Camp Pendleton in San Diego. And so that night, James's strong heart was transplanted into Mike Cohen, saving his life. James's mother, Christine Cheers, was overwhelmed with the grief after her Navy son's death. That tiny sliver of hope that kept her going was the knowledge that her son James was still helping people, that he was still living inside the recipients of all his organs. So she wrote letters to the four recipients of his son's vital organs. She heard back from two of them, and Mike Cohen was one of those who was so grateful. So he got in touch, and then one year after Mike's heart transplant, he planned a cross-country bicycle trip all the way from San Diego to Jacksonville, Florida, to visit the grave site of the man whose heart gave him new life. Christine Cheers and her husband followed Mike's cross-country bike trip on social media. And on November 20th, just recently in 2019, Mike and his friends arrived at the cemetery where James Musacelli was buried. Christine hugged this young man and they wept for a long time. Mike knelt at James's grave and thanked him for giving his heart so that he could have new life. Friends, that is what Jesus did for us on the cross. He gave his heart so that we might have life. He gave his life so that we can have eternity. And that is what Peter and Jesus and the disciples are sharing with us today. They say, for what will it profit a man or a woman to gain the whole world? and lose their soul. What can anyone give in exchange for their life? Friends, one of my favorite hymns when I became a Christian as a teenager and a believer in Jesus Christ is this hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Friends, what does the cross mean to you today? Is it just a symbol? Is it just something that you wear as an ornament? Or is it something that you can look upon where the Savior gave his life so that we can have eternal life? I want to invite you for a moment to ask yourself this question. Am I truly following Jesus? 
Am I willing to deny myself daily, take up my cross, and follow him? Do I want to save my life or lose it for the sake of the gospel so that I will find the true meaning and purpose for our lives? Friends, the cross is the symbol that gave power to the world. And it can give power to you. It can heal the sick. When we look upon the Savior who spoke that he has finished it for us on the cross. I invite you for a moment of silence if you have never asked Christ who died on the cross into your heart. That you say, I thank you, O Christ, that you paid the price for my sin. That your heart bled so that I might have new life. Here, O Christ, I open my heart's door so that I receive true meaning, purpose for living. I pray this as you love me so much that you gave yourself to suffer agony for me on the hill called Calvary. Thank you for your mercy that reaches my heart. Thank you for bearing my pain. Thank you for offering new hope to be born again. In Jesus' name I pray, and everyone said, Amen. I invite Barb Ewald to sing this closing song. Make this your prayer. The Old Rugged Cross, number 504, The Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll change. One day we will exchange the cross for a crown of life, a crown that Jesus himself will give to all those who overcome. Go forth from this place. May the cross be the symbol that you carry in your hearts. May the cross be the healing power. May the cross bring strength for you for the journey. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion and fellowship of God the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, I'd like to share a few announcements with you. Uh, if you'd like to order the script uh, program, please bring your order forms uh, to the church. Uh, Monday is the day to order. And uh, September 1st, did I say that? September 1st. We are into September on Tuesday. The Education Committee will meet at 6 o'clock. The United Methodist Women's Executive Board 
will meet at 6.30. And on Wednesday at 9 o'clock, the retired men will gather. At 10 a.m., our prayer phone-in uh, fellowship is continuing on. If you'd like to join in, the number to dial is 425-436-6371. Uh, you can call the office and we can give it to you. The pin is 2471. And at 5.30, we are having a very quiet time of prayer with communion. So if you'd like to join in on, on, on Wednesdays at 5.30, come for a time of quiet prayer. You don't have to pray out loud, but we will have communion after a short devotion. And in, in the, the month of September... On Wednesdays at 7.15, we will be having a new edition on Facebook Live. It is uh, Scripture and Song. We'll look at the history, the context, the authors of the hymns, uh, sacred hymns, because our theology is reflected in our hymnody. That's what uh, theologians say. So we'll be looking at the, the, the hymns, and for the next five weeks in September, we will be having that service. So if you'd like to join in, you're welcome at 7.15. We'll be having it here in the sanctuary as well. The upper rooms are available for our devotion and for our Christian nurture. They are also available right after church. And during the week, between 8.30 and noon, they will be available on a cart at the Liberty Street awning sign. Please come and help yourself. And as Diane shared with us, we are going to have Sunday school in two weeks' time. Uh, September 13th via Facebook, live, and by Zoom. Go forth in the name of Christ. Live for him, serve him, and look for times and opportunities where he can share the message of the cross. Go in peace. Amen.